Okay, well, my clock just turned over to two o'clock, so I'm happy to start right on time if everybody's ready. Um, everybody in, uh, in admin council across the institution, just in the interest of uh, making sure that we're sharing information and answering everyone's questions about all that's been happening here since the advent of uh, all of the changes we're experiencing for COVID-19 is hosting a town hall meeting just for the purpose of allowing everyone to uh, ask questions in um, an environment where you can get an immediate answer and, and have some discussion. Um, joining us is Jenny Lorimore. She is from the Office of Marketing and Communications. She's our brand manager. Um, and she is mediating all of these town hall meetings and has a few instructions to share with everybody before we get started. So Jenny, go ahead. Thanks, Colleen. Hey, everybody. Okay, so there are gonna be a couple of options uh, for submitting questions during this town hall meeting. So if you hover over your video Zoom screen, uh, you'll see some icons at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on chat, your chat feature will open up to the right. And if you've never used this before, um, there are a couple of options here. One is you can ask your question to everyone and I'll find it here and, and read it to Pauline. Um, and the everyone looks like this that I just sent out. Everybody would get a copy of your question. Um, and then if you wanna ask an anonymous question, we absolutely welcome you to do that. And how you do that is you'll just drop down or start typing in my name, Jenny Laramore, and then uh, you'll know that it's um, a private conversation between the two of us because it'll say Jenny Laramore and then in red it will say privately. So that will ensure that you're just um, talking to me and I'll ask the question anonymously. Um, and then I want to remind you that this uh, session is being recorded so that anybody who missed it might be able to watch it later. And all of our town hall meetings are recorded and added to isu.edu slash town hall. And I just sent that out as well on the chat. And um, you can go back and look at any of our university town hall meetings. Um, and I will stop talking now. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so I will just get started really quickly with a brief overview. Um, Many of you have been talking uh, too frequently in our, our meetings. So some of you I haven't had the opportunity to talk to as much over these weeks of working from home, but thank you for such a good turnout um, and for being here to show your interest in, and to get some of the answers that you need. Uh, as most of you are aware, about Big Sky basketball tournament time, the world really flipped on us and we experienced some major changes. Uh, students moving to on online delivery of classes, um, of course, our training regimen changed, our spring seasons were canceled. Um, most of our spring student um, athletes did not have the opportunity to compete. Um, so it's been certainly something very hard for them and we've spent a majority of our time really trying to focus on how to keep them engaged and supported during this time. And many of you have been instrumental in that, moving your uh, team meetings and um, engaging with your teams via Zoom was one of the one of the few ways that you're able to do that as well as on social media. Um, we're moving forward. I'd like to um, feel optimistic about the fact that the institution is beginning to work on a reopen plan. Uh, the reopen plan will follow the governor's guidelines that came out a few days ago uh, that has phase one beginning May 1st and moving to a phase two, which could begin to open up some of our facilities on a very, very limited basis. But those will be first steps back into uh, life as we once knew it. If we ever get to anything that looks like life as we once knew it, things will be different for sure. But we are talking about returning to work and returning to training, and that's very, very good. Um, as most of you know, um, COVID-19 has had a profound impact on the state budget and on state institution budgets. And virtually all of you have participated in one way or another in suggesting ways that we could meet a new budget mark that is significantly uh, diminished from where we had hoped to be uh, pre-COVID, but everybody has participated in getting our budget to where it needs to be in order to uh, be successful and work within a reasonable um, framework next year. So I wanna thank everybody for that. Uh, for your involvement and just for your, um, you know, the sacrifices that you're making so that we can mitigate the impact on our student athletes. Um, with that, 
I'd kind of touched on what's been consuming our world in recent weeks is just planning for our student athletes and planning for adjustments we're going to have to make in the year to come. Uh, to get more than specific about all of that, I would love to just uh, field your questions. And I would like to note it's great to see see most of your faces. I haven't seen some of you for a while, so that feels really good. Thanks for being here. Pauline, will we be able to start camps June 29, 30th to get a weekend before the holiday, July 4th? Well, that remains to be seen. I wish I had a crystal ball to answer that question. I, the answer is that I hope so. I think that the NCAA is going to be very uh, sensitive to the fact that student athletes need some time to prepare in order to uh, be ready and to be healthy for the fall. So I'm hoping that they'll give us some guidance and I expect them to give us guidance about when we can be on campus. Uh, we do expect to be able to go forward with summer school. Um, summer access might very well just look different. So if we are able to get into camp, uh, it be prepared for it to be uh, in groups of 10 or less or groups of 50 or less, depending on what phase of the reopen that we're into. But I am very hopeful that, yes, we will be able to do some training this summer and uh, that we might get permission to do that a little bit earlier than normal. Pauline, what can we do to help you or administration right now? Well, the first thing is to, um, you know, continue to, to work and be productive in the ways that you can with, with student athletes. And I have to say, I've been in amazement at how well everyone has done that. You know, they are the first concern for all of us. And certainly coaches and staff could just be sitting back right now, kicking up their feet, you know, shooting out an email or a tweet now and again to student athletes. But, but you haven't been doing that. You've been engaging with them, reading different books together, uh, having Zoom calls, uh, having little, you know, really fun, good-natured types of competitions on your team uh, and giving them lots and lots of encouragement. That's probably number one. Um, the other thing that, that you all have done to help me is you've engaged with your supervisors in helping us uh, decide ways that we could achieve some savings and adjust our budget for next year. I've had uh, assistant coaches on the phone adjusting their schedules, um, combining different opponents on road trips, uh, working really hard to make sure that we're being responsible in our equipment purchases and all of those things um, are really what you can be doing. I think just uh, continuing to communicate, send me an email, um, uh, give me a call, let's get on a Zoom anytime you have an idea. It's just today, uh, I, I haven't yet opened them and looked at them all, but Joe Silvers sent me a Google Doc with a number of different ideas for the fall that, that are things we should be thinking about with regard to orienting our students and, and getting them started off here in the right foot. So just continuing to have that great dialogue and um, keep participating in the shared governance of our department. Uh, those, I mean, I couldn't possibly ask for more than that. Okay. Um, follow up question for the summer question. Will we have to quarantine kids that return to campus for summer workouts? Yes, yes, that's a great question, and we should be thinking about that. Uh, phase one and two still require uh, that those who come in from out of state must be quarantined, self-quarantined for two weeks before engaging in small group activities. What are we doing or should we be doing in the department for our plans in the weight room, training room, and practices to follow CDC guidelines and prepare for reopening? Well, a lot of those things took place early in that, you know, there was a deep cleaning of the weight room um, and supplies have been ordered because we knew they'd take a long time to get here in terms of disinfectant and spray cleaner, uh, things to be engaged with in the, in, in the weight room when we're together. Uh, numbers are gonna have to be low to begin with. We're gonna have to be training um, if all goes according to plan in groups of 10 or less once we get into uh, phase two and we can reopen. So scheduling is going to be, you know, something that we have to be very careful about working with Dan and with Brandon 
to make sure we have those small groups in the weight room. Be prepared that your whole team will not be able to train together, even if they're used to that. Whether you're inside or outside, we're going to have to be working within groups of 10 to begin with. And then there will be guidelines in the weight room. We actually have a meeting uh, this Friday with Dr. Solbrig, Ron Solbrig, and with Rex Force uh, to help us develop all of the criteria that we'll have to adhere to when we, um, when we reopen. There will probably be a cleaning regimen that'll be in place for equipment. Uh, there'll be some limitations on what equipment we can use and what we can share. For instance, uh, I don't know if football will be able to have mouthpieces and helmet just yet. Um, things like that are yet to be determined, but I think you should be thinking about how to train in small groups primarily and how to limit physical contact in these early stages of our reopen. Next question, Pauline. BSU announced a plan for furloughs. Will ISU move forward with furloughing plans? And if so, when and what will this look like? Uh, I believe that ISU will move forward with a furlough plan in the new uh, fiscal year. That has been in discussion and in consideration and is just being built uh, very thoughtfully. Um, that will be one of the balancing levers of the institution um, to experience some savings because we really don't know what fall enrollment or state funding is going to look like or any of the other revenue sources that we generate. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the BSU plan. That was a furlough of quite a large number of days between now and July 1st. Um, there are no plans at this time for any mandatory furlough that would take place between now and July 1st. After July 1st, I believe we'll uh, probably be looking at some kind of a plan that will involve the most highly compensated employees taking the largest number of furlough days, and it will move uh, on down the scale to a small number of days for uh, those compensated at uh, uh, lesser levels. So I think that's something that we will see and it would be implemented over the course of an entire fiscal year uh, beginning July 1st. Okay. Pauline, what should we tell people in the community who are asking us about reopening? What is our official party line? Should we say we're hoping for the best for the fall, et cetera? Well, right now, uh, if you had the opportunity to watch President Satterley's um, last video that he sent out, he was very optimistic and he said that our plans are to be open for business in the fall. Uh, so we are expecting to be able to deliver classes in person. Uh, we are expecting to be able to train. I think that, I think it's safe to say that that is our hope, that we'll be following all of the state and CDC guidelines but right now, the phase-in plan for Idaho has us up and running uh, by August. So that's what we're planning for. That's what we're hoping for. But of course, the institution is going to be uh, very sensitive to any changes. And, and should we need to bump back from phase three to phase two and take more precautions in the fall, we will. But right now, I am smiling big and I'm telling the world we're, we're hoping to be open for business, um, ready to roll forward in the fall. I think uh, uh, that if we're being realistic, we have to expect that attendance will look different, that crowd control is going to look different. And I don't know how that is yet, but obviously uh, any group uh, events or gatherings will have to be within the criteria that the state sets for us at that time. Much of the activity on campus has slowed down, but things seem to be moving well at Davis Field. Could you update us all on Davis Field construction progress? Well, I'm told uh, in about a weekly report that Davis Field is moving uh, according to schedule and according to budget. Uh, the expectation, unless we have some extreme weather events that keep us from making progress um, in the fall with regard to uh, the finished top of the track, we expect to be done uh, by Thanksgiving with Davis Field. It's progressing very well. I know our marketing staff has started to work uh, with facilities uh, to learn about the, um, the scoreboard and the video capability that's going to be possible there in a different way so that we can get ready for that. But uh, the project has not hit any snags. It's moving uh, forward right on schedule and right on budget. And um, 
it's been something that, you know, uh, I've had so much positive feedback from the community about Davis Field and the fact that something exciting is happening that represents progress. Uh, it's our first new facility in a long, long time. So Davis has always been kind of special uh, to people. And right now it's serving as, you know, a special role as kind of a beacon of hope to everybody right now as well. So I'm really pleased with that progress and I'm looking forward to um, being able to open it in November. Uh, we don't have any more questions at this moment, but that also means there's no waiting. So feel free to ask any questions. Okay, here's a new one. Um, the COVID-19 has shown a huge trend about the Flintstones. The people of Dubai do not watch the Flintstones, but the people of Abu, Abu Dhabi do. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to that other than I love the Flintstones. I'm a huge fan. Um, and uh, I'll take a, a giant turkey leg anytime I can find one. So I'm a Flintstones fan. I'm not sure how else to respond to that unless we take a straw poll and see who else on the call is a Flintstones fan. <laughs> that felt like inside info. <laughs> Next question. Um, this situation has greatly impacted coaches' ability to properly prepare our, students, our student athletes. Is there a plan to look at our coaches' current contracts and make adjustments based on this quote-unquote lost time? You know, I've had a number of conversations with coaches about contracts, and I think that um, uh, this is, we've talked about stability and hope and compassion and trust as the four pillars that we stand on at Idaho State. So in our individual uh, conversations, I think that our individual head coaches are going to see that come through and they're going to feel supported. Pauline, what does Idaho State University have working for us in our advantage right now? Well, there are a few things. Number one is, you know, over the years, and I, I would never throw other institutions under the bus, uh, but speaking about us, we've been a fiscally responsible institution. And, you know, we have the opportunity now of um, knowing how to do more with less. Uh, we know what our operation looks like in an, uh, in an effective way when it's a little bit smaller and we're able to dial back and, and turn our, our budget growth that we've realized recently to dial that back a little bit and still be productive. So the institution is in a strong fiscal position in terms of being able to weather a storm responsibly. We don't have a huge amount of debt. We aren't bonded. Uh, up to our eyeballs. We have the opportunity now to utilize some of those resources so that we can uh, move forward and mitigate the impact on students. We have that going for us. Um, I think we have a great leadership team going for us in that um, we are going through this terrible budget experience where we have to make cuts, but those are not being made in a vacuum. Uh, we've been part of budget meetings where every department and every unit leader can see what every other unit leader is offering up and give feedback and collaborate. Um, and that style, I think, of governance of an institution is really, really beneficial and helps to get institutions through difficult times like this. Um, and I also think we have a very loyal Bengal base. Um, some of my colleagues are getting emails uh, from their base saying, hey, you know, I just can't help out this year. I just can't do it. I'm really happy to report that we are getting emails saying, hey, why haven't you sent us our Bengal Athletic Boosters renewal yet? We're ready to do that. We're hoping to buy our tickets. We're ready to come back in the fall. So I think our community has really bought into um, the roar at Idaho State, and that certainly is a tremendous benefit. Um, we had a great fundraising year last year. That's going to mitigate the impact on some things. For that reason, um, we're not doing what some of our sister institutions are doing and, and cutting summer school. We're going to have summer school support. We're going to be able to invest in that, um, whereas some of our peer institutions in the big sky are not. And I think in the end, that will be a tremendous benefit. So I think our fiscal, uh, fiscally responsible approach over time 
is something we have going for us, our loyal base, and uh, the leadership style and the transparency that is spreading across our campus very successfully is certainly a big thing that we have going for us in this crisis. Okay. Some conferences, Mountain West Sunbelt Conference USA, have asked the NCAA to relax requirements for minimum number of sports sponsorships. What is the Big Sky doing moving forward during this time and planning for lower funding levels? Well, the Big Sky is um, having a lot of Zoom calls to talk about that. I know that the Big Sky has submitted a, a, a long list of legislation proposing relief, and in one of them, is in sport sponsorship and everyone expects uh, the majority of those uh, relief suggestions to pass. We do expect sport sponsorship to be relaxed. We do expect even uh, requirements for summer access to be relaxed. I'm kind of counting on it as you'll see when you see what our summer school awards look like. Um, so the Big Sky's been active in proposing legislation that has come up through in each institution. Uh, but the three major sports committees that exist at the Big Sky are the Olympic Sports Committee, the Basketball Committee, and the Football Committee. And each of these committees has been charged with revisiting each and every sport and looking at what we can do differently in terms of officiating, in terms of travel, in terms of conference schedule, and in terms of conference championships to reduce the cost of executing the conference season this year. Um, I've talked about some of those with individual coaches in those sports, uh, and some championships are on the table to be cut. Uh, some conference schedules, volleyball for instance, instead of making a circular trip and traveling to play NAU and then traveling to play Southern Utah, they'll probably go to NAU and play a match Friday and a match Saturday and come home. And then Southern Utah will come to Idaho State and play on Friday and play Saturday and go home. And adjustments like that are not intended to be permanent, but in the course of one conference season will save a significant amount of dollars. Um, so there are probably four or five proposals on the table for each sport. And when I say four or five, I mean one with relative to officiating, one relative to schedule, one relative to championships, uh, one relative maybe to something new that was going to be instituted like uh, instant replay was coming for volleyball this year. That's going to be pushed out a year because of the expense to many of the schools. So the Big Sky is doing what it can to alter its uh, business as usual to accommodate the budgeting needs of our individual schools. And a follow-up question for that, Pauline, is there a timeline for when final decisions will be released? I certainly hope that uh, the Olympic Sports Committee recommendations are ready to go and actually will be considered by the JAC this week. Um, football and basketball will take a little bit longer, but I certainly think that by May 1st, we will know what our conference seasons are going to look like. Next question. In the years past, we have had end of year celebrations for our seniors. With graduation and those events canceled, will there be anything from the department done to recognize our graduating seniors or their department gifts as they have had in the past? Uh, yes, actually, we've just had their, uh, the uh, academic stoles uh, have just been printed. They were ordered and, and we couldn't get them printed because so many businesses were shut down, but uh, Q was able to make some calls to uh, Bengal Works and get a few uh, skeleton crew in to get those printed. So we will be sending them their, their uh, stoles. We will be sending them their blankets or asking them to come pick them up. And we will be doing kind of virtual senior days. Uh, we started this week with softball so that uh, much like the Benyon Awards, each uh, student athlete will have a graphic and some of their accolades and a thank you that goes up on social media. And then uh, all of our students are gonna be invited to participate in commencement, uh, winter commencement, because many of them might wanna make that trip to come back and walk. Um, so we're doing the best that we can to recognize them online. Uh, and we will absolutely be sending them their senior stoles and their blankets as a department gesture. And then I know individual programs 
have been uh, getting them the usual senior gifts, um, at least in a couple of cases that I've already seen and getting those shipped out to them as well. Okay. Many health experts are stating COVID will return in the fall and could be worse uh, than what we are experiencing now. What is our contingency plan if fall sports are impacted? Well, a lot of the contingency planning has to do with the budget, which is why we have made the cuts we've made and will continue to rely on some of the balancing levers of the institution. Um, it would be a profound impact, for instance, if we were not able to play football, if we were not able to have any sports at all, uh, we would see major changes in what we're able to execute. We might, um, um, the contingency plans are really hard to visit. I was on a call with uh, a podcast for the NCAA and the chief medical officer asked people to plan for three scenarios, said, you know, number one, plan for a, an August 1st start. Number two, plan for a December start. And number three, plan for no activity for one year. So many of the budget cuts that we've already made are intended uh, to help us at least be in a position to maintain a um, base skeleton operations should any of those things happen. But again, we're gonna have to react as we see the public health change. And this is also the reason we have to be extremely conscientious about our reopen plan. The more diligent we are in our reopen plan about acknowledging the state guidelines and the CDC guidelines, the less apt we are to be in a dire situation come the fall with a recurrence. I think everybody thinks there'll be a recurrence. Nobody believes that COVID will be wiped out, but if we can continue to control levels in Idaho, we would be better off than most. Okay, Pauline, you mostly answered this um, follow-up question, but how will the athletic department operate if there's a total loss to football revenue? Is there anything that you haven't mentioned that you'd like to elaborate on? Well, if there were a total loss to football revenue, uh, we would be in a better position than if there were a partial loss, loss because we would also be uh, foregoing most of the expenses. If there was no season, uh, we would come out relatively you know, in a, in a relatively fair spot where we could continue to operate and it wouldn't impact uh, every sport in a dramatic way. It would impact every sport in a small way, but not in a dramatic way, not in a way that we could not recover from. So um, we're prepared for that. What we have to consider uh, is the fact that we are not in deep debt to the institution. And our hope is that between what is available um, through some of our foundation resources uh, and through planning over multiple years into the future with our uh, uh, finance and administration department that we would be able to weather a storm of one fall. Um, but hopefully we would return to play in the spring and mostly be able to address the experience of those student athletes. Uh, but things would look very, very different without football revenue and uh, we would have to tighten our belts even a little bit more than we are tightening them now. There would probably be competitions that would be canceled, and we might even have to look at future changes in staff um, and additional furloughs. Uh, quite frankly, that would be a very extreme situation, and, and the measures to address it would be significant, but um, I trust that we would be wise enough to still weather that storm. Um, Follow-up question to that, is there a chance that football would be moved to the spring? Uh, I've heard that discussed on the NCAA level. I've heard it discussed that there could be a late start uh, and that perhaps non-conference games would actually be played in the spring. So I, I think there's a possibility of that. Um, but what I, I am encouraged about is that the FCS football committee, um, along with um, the FBS football committee, are discussing all of those eventualities and they are doing everything that they can to make sure that at some point in the next fiscal year uh, all of those games uh, could be played. So I, I think that um, if football were to not happen we would be in a very extreme situation because everyone's doing everything that they can to avoid that. 
Kathleen, next question. There were potential pay raise opportunities before this pandemic. Is it safe to say that there will be no chance for that? Yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say. There's been um, a statewide hiring freeze. Uh, every personnel action um, from, you know, as you all know, we were in the process of, of we were very close to hiring an SWA, and uh, we're not going forward with that. We're not going forward with hiring a UBO. Um, there are only a handful of open positions on campus being uh, filled. We did uh, work to an extreme measure through our own Department of uh, Human Resources and through the Division of Human Resources at the state level to be able to make some hires and some changes uh, that had already been way down the road at the time when COVID hit and we were really lucky to get those approved. So I think it's safe to say that across the institution, if we're considering a furlough, that any, any increases for any personnel at the institution would be very unlikely. Um, uh, we do hope that, uh, however, come December, come halfway through the fiscal year, you know, there's a lot of hope that our position will look very different and we can begin to talk about making some of those things right. No questions at the moment, Pauline. Okay. We've had a lot of really great questions so far. Um, and I appreciate it. And uh, I really appreciate the good work that everyone on this staff and everyone throughout the department has been doing. I've had a lot of conversations with student athletes and they have very much appreciated the level of contact that they have had from uh, the staff, from their coaches. Um, and they've been very, very complimentary and very appreciative of that. So I feel, you know, very proud of our department and the work that that they have been doing to keep focused on our number one priority and that's our students. No more questions, Jenny? I don't see any, nope. Okay. Are we obligated to go uh, 60 minutes? You are not. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm happy to have any questions either now or um, at a later time by phone, text, or email. I think everybody here knows I'm not very hard to get a hold of. So feel free to put me on the spot in some other situation if you have information that you need. We have one more here. Um, is there a chance that football, whoops, sorry, ISU has been ahead of the curve in preparing and talking about, in talking with about eight head coaches from Utah, most of them had not been asked to cut budgets because they had not started the process. Yabba dabba doo. That is referring to the earlier joke that I butchered in my um, execution, which is, I Googled it, what's the difference between Dubai and Abu Dhabi? People in Dubai <laughs> don't like the Flintstones, but people in Abu, Abu, Abu Dhabi do. Abu Dhabi do. Yeah. So well, I think it's, you know, one, one reason, I like to think that we've just been very proactive, and actually I think that we have. Um, but the other uh, uh, factor is that our state, that Idaho has asked us for specific targets to cut back, even uh, prior to COVID, going into next year, you know, we experienced a 2% rescission and we estimated budgets, we crafted budgets that were down 2%. In addition to that, we have been asked to submit budgets uh, at a 5% reduction. So obviously colleagues in uh, the state of Utah, and I have noticed this also on uh, some of our big sky calls, they haven't been asked to make uh, budget cuts across uh, the university but I think that they haven't been asked yet. Um, Idaho is a fiscally conservative state. Um, our tax revenues have obviously been hit in a significant way uh, by the stay home orders. And so I think that in true, true to form, we're being fiscally responsible going forward. But um, we have been asked specifically at the state level for the cuts that we've made. Uh, and things like the furlough uh, will, will be intended 
to compensate for a lot of unknowns that the institution may face in terms of enrollment and other, other um, losses of revenue. So when you ask how we're preparing, uh, should this get worse in the fall, that's one of the ways that we're preparing should this get worse in the fall, in addition to the existing cuts. Um, I will say that there's all, there are some really positive uh, indicators on the horizon uh, regarding enrollment. I don't. I think it's premature to jump up and down and run outside and celebrate. But um, you know, things like the number of applications are actually up, and uh, paid applications for housing are up by a few students uh, for this time of year. So those are very, very encouraging uh, signs. And the best way ever that we have to turn around any budget. Uh, crisis or any budget cutting period of time is to increase enrollment and um, athletics is an important part of that the way that you engage with your student athletes the way that you engage with fans and the community um, everything that we do is a very visible piece of the institution and it contributes to enrollment so the way that uh, your student athletes, our student athletes have contributed over the last year and engaged with other students on campus, those have been important for the overall student experience. And I really strongly believe um, that the way this department has represented ISU and the way our student athletes have engaged with others has contributed to some of those positive signs that we're seeing in enrollment. So that is a hats off to all of you. I think that's it for questions, Pauline. Okay. Well, everybody, thanks for spending uh, some time with me today. That's 37 minutes of, I think, very, very good questions. Uh, gives you 23 more minutes of this hour where, where you can go and, and continue doing the good work that you've been doing. So if there's anything else I have to say to this group, it is just um, a very, very big, very heartfelt, Thank you for the way that all of you have responded to what is just an unprecedented time um, in higher education and in collegiate athletics. And um, I can tell you that as I hear from colleagues and talk with other ADs, um, our people, this staff, all of you are doing an extremely, extremely good job. And I'm very proud of that and very, very appreciative of it. So thank you, everybody.